But right off the bat, the odds are 95 to 5 that he's thinking, acting, and talking like the wrong group. They're wonderful people. They love him. They'd do anything in the world for him. They want him to succeed. But the odds are 95 to 5. They haven't got the answers he needs if he's to reach fulfillment as a human being, if he's to reach this success that he wants, if he's to reach into these deep reservoirs of ability and genius we know he possesses and draw it out. Well, he starts in school. The most important thing to a little boy in school is to be liked by the other little boys in school. And so at this tender age, he begins to follow other little boys his same age who don't know any more than he knows and who do not necessarily have any capacity for leadership. And he does this in the first grade and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh and the eighth and year after year after year, he forms himself into a composite average of other little boys his age trying to be like them, trying to do the only thing in the world that's impossible for a human being to do, which is to be like somebody else. Now, let's say he goes all the way through school, usually goes in the military service. Again, he's caught in a vice-like grip of conformity. Now, let's say he's 25 years old, out of school, out of service. What's he going to do? As a rule, uh, he'll go back to his hometown, unless he's married, in which case he'll go to his wife's hometown. But let's say he goes back to his own hometown, he's single, he doesn't know quite what to do, and he's standing on a corner one morning, and a friend that he knew in school comes up and says, Hi there, uh, Charlie, what are you doing? He says, Nothing. He says, Why don't you come down and work where I work? It's a pretty good place, the pay's regular, we got all kinds of fringe benefits and so on, and so he does. The odds are about, again, 95 to 5, that his first job is taken as a result of random application. On the job, without thinking about it, the most natural thing in the world for him to do is to look around and see how the other guys are doing their job and to begin doing his the same way, assuming that what is normal for them is normal for him. No reason for this. He doesn't think about it. He just does it. Now, he has stretching in front of him 50 years or more in the golden age that man has been dreaming of since the days of ancient Greece. What's he going to do with these 50 golden years? Well, let's take a close look at him. We know that he works 40 hours a week as a rule. 40 hours a week, which leaves him 72 hours a week when he's neither working nor sleeping. 72 free discretionary hours each week to do it as he pleases. Now, at this point, of course, he's married. He has his little house and his little car. And this is about what he does with his free 72 hours every week. He'll do what the other fellows are doing with their free 72 hours every week, which is virtually nothing at all. On a typical day, he'll quit right on the dot, get in his little car, go to his little house, go in his little kitchen, kiss his little wife, and say, I'm tired. They've even figured out why he says that. The experts believe that he used to hear his father say that back when men used to get tired working during the day, and he picked it up and he repeats this every night when he gets home. He bolts his little meal and then heads for the living room where he turns on his escape box. Click. Takes 15 or 20 seconds for the screen to light up. A period of time he finds interminable, but he gets through it somehow. Maybe kicks the dog or thumbs through a magazine or something. Then the screen lights up and he does too a little bit, and uh, there in front of him uh, he sees people in all kinds of funny old-time costumes all killing each other at a great rate. Uh, one expert has agreed that uh, the average family can see more death and bloodshed and carnage on his television set in a week than Crassus saw when he crucified 6,000 prisoners on the southern road to Rome. But you know how those experts are. He could certainly be off one or two. But he sits there for about five and a half or six hours. Twenty-five percent of all free time now is spent in front of the tube, according to the latest statistics. Now, there's nothing wrong with this particularly, except that he's watching other people who are earning excellent incomes in the pursuit of their careers, while he doesn't make a nickel and gets the only two things you can get from watching TV on that kind of a schedule. He gets red eyes and a hollow head. Now, this is not meant to be an indictment of television. I've got a couple of television sets at home, too. I have a couple of cars at home, too, but I don't go home at night and drive around the block for six hours. If there's some place I want to go, fine, my car will take me there. If there's a great program, like a golf match or something like that, I want to see it. But he sits there for six and a half hours until finally his wife, who's a little more practical than he is, taps him on the shoulder and she says, Charlie, I think it's about time you went to bed. You've got to get up in the morning and go to work. And he's okay, and he shuts it off. He knows how to do that. He just shuts it off and goes to bed. Next morning he gets up and he does this all over again. He does this every day for 40 years. At the end of 40 years, he's retired, which always kind of catches him by surprise. No one's ever figured that one out either. And then he dies at 85 or 90, the way medical science is moving us along out of sheer boredom. Well, what's the problem? Is there a tragedy here? Not really if that's the way Charlie wants to spend his life, our mythical, hypothetical young man. If he wants to spend his life that way, that's his business. 
He lives in a free society, he can do anything with it he wants. But there's a terrible tragedy here if he's living that way because of the total lack of a decision. If he's living that way simply because he's still doing what he was doing in the first and second grade, and that's going along with the fellows up and down the block on the unspoken assumption that they know how to live, then there's a real tragedy there. Because they've never known how to live. Not in all the recorded history of mankind. He never finds out who he is. He never reaches into the deep depths of his abilities, his talents. He never learns that he can have just about anything he wants in the world, that he can call his own shots, tell his own fortune. And it's kind of a pity. Well, what's needed? Well, what's needed, I think, is a checklist, like an airplane pilot uses. I think that living successful is as important as flying an airplane. And here are some of the things that I think should be on that checklist that could help this man live a more meaningful, more interesting, more exciting, more enjoyable life. The first thing that he ought to have on his checklist, in my opinion, is the word, a goal. A man without a goal is like a ship without a rudder. He doesn't know where he's going. He then belongs to that 95% that he's just living day by day, month after month, like a starfish or an amoeba. He needs to know where he's going. Back in the early days of navigation, sailors used to see a strange sight in the Antarctic. They'd see a giant iceberg towering high out of the sea, and it would be moving against the wind. The wind would be blowing this way. The great iceberg would be moving right into the teeth of the wind. And this, uh, of course, frightened the sailors whose ships were powered by the wind until it was discovered that, of course, only a fraction of the great berg was visible and that its huge, ponderous roots were caught in the great currents of the ocean. And it was being borne purposely along its way, regardless of the winds and the tides on the surface. Well, this is what a man needs. He needs his roots deep in a great mainstream of his own choosing. And then he'll move along his way, regardless of the winds on the surface of his life or short-term expediency. And he'll get to where he's going. The second word on our checklist might be the word attitude. It's been called the most important word in any language in the world. Because it's our attitude toward our world, toward all the people in it, that will determine the world's attitude and all the people's attitude toward us. It's a simple thing, most of us know it, but we tend to forget it. People will react to us according to our attitude. And our attitude is the greatest gift we can be given. You know, the little creatures of the world were given a wonderful gift by Mother Nature called protective coloring, in which they can blend into their background without uh, being seen. But man was not given this great gift, because man was given an incalculably greater one. Only man has the godlike power to make his surroundings change to fit him. Because his environment will change as he changes. A man's environment is a merciless mirror of him as a human being. And if he thinks his environment can stand a little improvement, all he has to do is improve, and his environment will improve to reflect the changing man. Third would be the word think. To think the highest function of which a human being is capable. It was put pretty well by the great Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Archibald MacLeish in his great play, The Secret of Freedom, in which he has one of his characters say, the only thing about a man that is a man is his mind. Everything else you can find in a pig or a horse. 